uh, the last uh, group. Eh? And uh, of course, I see I came here for the opening. The numbers have withered a little bit for, since the morning. And I can't blame because there is a fatigue of listening to so many panelists. But it's a very interesting session, and I would like to congratulate KSI for daring to have a physical uh, conference like this. Uh, so without uh, wasting a lot of time, now that we are pressed, hard pressed for time, I have here four distinguished uh, panelists who will discuss the financial literacy and financial inclusion, protecting the unbanked in an era of digital banking and consumer protection. Now, that sparked a thought in me, not only protecting the unbanked, they should also be protecting the banked as well. So <laughs> that, so that uh, because now uh, the data protection and all that has become very important. So we have here uh, Dr. Dr. Paul Selvaraj, who is the CEO of Formca. He's been there for a long time. I always uh, read about his statements in the press. So they will discuss. I've, uh, I, as a moderator, will sort of disappear in the thin air and leave the floor to the panelists to take center stage so that we can manage the time more efficiently. Nato, Dr. Uh, good evening, Dr. Chairman, honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, on behalf of FOMCA, I'd like to thank the organizers for including consumer protection in a topic on banking and financial services. Now, a consumer normally, they have, we have eight basic rights. And I think in a modern economy, access to banking has to be recognized as one of the basic needs of consumers. Because you cannot function uh, without, uh, without having access to financial services. And today, uh, to be an effective consumer uh, in, in, today's, uh, in today's economy, I think there are three points that I will, I will be touching on. Firstly is financial inclusion. Secondly is financial education. And thirdly, on financial consumer protection. Uh, just to start with the definition of financial inclusion according to uh, Bank Nagara, uh, consumers have access to useful and affordable financial products and services that meet their needs delivered in a responsible and sustainable way. Yeah? Now very often when we think of financial in inclusion, one of the first things that comes to mind is does a person have an account, bank account, yeah? And uh, Bank Nagara have their own indicator, and according to their indicator, they score uh, 0.9 out of 1. So assume that's a very high score. Now, my first point is that having an account doesn't necessarily make you an effective consumer, yeah? Although we have actually been involved with uh, Bank Nagara to bring financial services to remote areas, both in in the peninsula in, in, in Sabah, Sarawak. Uh, there was a time of uh, infrastructure, I mean, there was real banks, and we'd go to the remote areas and talk to them about the importance of banking and how they should, uh, how they should you know, uh, be, be in, in integrated into the banking sector. But I think what I want to emphasize here is that, yes, having an account is crucial, yeah? But that itself is not sufficient. So financial inclusion is certainly important, but uh, it's not just having an account, but it's how it's used, those account is used. And, um, you know, a lot of um, low-income, aged, vulnerable groups, uh, to get their bantuan, bantuan sarahidup, you cannot get your bantuan sarahidup unless you have a bank account. So you have a big group having a bank account just to get their transfer payments. So that's not very... I mean, that's not very great in terms of how the financial sector is being used, yeah? And again, being financially included, as, as Dr. Chai mentioned, it's not just the unbanked, it's also the bank. When we say bank, we just say those have a bank account. I mean, it's just that. But, uh, and, and the number of those who are having a bank account is high because it also reflects a lot of people are getting transfer payments, you know? And it does not in any way reflect that, you know, they are financially responsible or financially well-managed. For example, in the UND report, it says that 88% of consumers reported no savings. 88% reported no savings. Now, having an account is good, 
but you don't have money to keep for savings. You know? So financial inclusion is, 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 is of course important, but these are some of the concerns. Now the more recent development is of course you're moving away from buildings called banks to digital banking. But even this, I, th I think there are two concerns. Firstly, whether, whether everyone has access to digital, digital banking. I mean, just in yesterday's paper, I mean, one of the big things during COVID was online education. And one third of school children have no access to internet. So oh, we're obviously talking of digital inequality, yeah? where a lot of people do not have access. And uh, this, is, th this means that you know, they will not have access to the, the other, all the services that come from the digital economy. But there's also something else that I, I emphasize, and in fact, we're pushing. Of course, digital banking brings a lot of benefits. But in a survey, in a study in uh, UK, where a lot of banks have been closing because of the digital economy, this also brings a lot of pain to the low income, to the aged, to the vulnerable groups we have been depending on simple bank to go and get their ATM cash, you know. And uh, in Malaysia, we have a lot of issues because some banks, in their urgency to switch to digital banking, have sort of, in our view at least, neglected those who are not skilled, who, do, who have no confidence, you know. And uh, they are still being forced, yeah. As interestingly, some commercial banks have made accommodation, try to accommodate and, and do something to help. Huh? Whereas some of the so-called government banks, where sometimes even the Bantuan Sarah Hidup is channeled, uh, have said that, look, you, you, you want your money, you, you have to learn how to operate online, yeah? or, or use the ATM machines. Uh, this creates a lot of suffering. And I think, uh, yes, digital economy is good, but we really need to think of the vulnerable groups and how we can provide the support. And I think that is not enough is being done for that. Yeah? The second issue, as far as effective financial uh, participation in the, in, the, in, the, in the financial sector for consumers is financial education. Of course, we all re recognize that it's, it's crucial, yeah? And one of the reasons it has become more important these days is because of the complexity of products. How many of us really understand, you know, what we sign? And, you know, one of the, one of the things that, well, any banks or many people use when you have an issue is they say, look, you signed. You have what is called informed consent. You sign, so you have informed consent. But in Germany, it was proved that less than 1% of the people actually read. And sometimes when you do bank, when you're doing digital, I mean, you're on the internet, you can't go to the next uh, frame until you agree. So you agree and you move to the next frame. Of course, you don't know what exactly you agreed to. Yeah? So products are complex, and unless we empower consumers, I think it's tough. I mean, for, for example, insurance, we are so much guided by what the agent tells us. It's only when we start making claims that we find that, you know, this is not covered, that is not covered. So we need to empower consumers to ask the right decisions so that they can make informed decisions. And that only comes through education. The, the second thing is, you know, as an economy, we have moved towards deregulation. In some ways, it's good. For example, Bank Negara used to regulate insurance motor insurance, now it's deregulated. But when you deregulate, you're going to assume that people have the capacity to study and make, make comparison and make decisions. And that's not necessarily true unless you, you empower them. Yeah? So uh, we, need, we need to build that capacity in people. Now, actually, uh, we do have uh, uh, financial literacy, but I think that's a strategy, but I think a lot more, lot more needs to be done in terms of empowering consumers. The third area is financial consumer protection. Uh, and I think because of the complexity of products and, and the dependence on consumers on, on these products, the central bank has to play a major role as a regulator. Yeah? I mean, we, we read, just read recently that you know, uh, uh, banks that have been scams, uh, banks have tried to impose fine on people who pay over the counter. I mean, unless there's a strong regulator, then, you know, I think consumers will be taken advantage. And of course, you might have access to, to redress. And of course, Pond Marina is the person you go to for redress. Uh, my only request is, especially at these times, instead of sitting to the letter of the law, I look at borrowers as human beings undergoing suffering, yeah? So sometimes you need that, 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 that balance. 
So, uh, and, and of course, through digital banking, a lot of issue of identity threat and, and many issues which, uh, well, some has to be protected through regulation, but also some through consumer protection. And, and finally, uh, I, I think the way forward uh, is both for the regulators as well as uh, consumers to play a, play a role. Uh, because uh, things are becoming complex and in many ways sometimes out of control. Huh? I mean, uh, for example, I was asked by a media yesterday, if you are scammed, where do I go for to, to get redress? If I wanted to put on Marina into trouble, I could have just said go to OFS. Huh? But the answer is if you are scammed, you are not going to get a redress. Yeah? That means the com consumer has to be empowered not to get trapped. So that is a responsibility, but I think we also need a strong regulator to ensure that consumers are protected and are able to use the financial services the best of their, uh, for, the be for their benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Paul. Uh, so the key takeaway from Dr. Paul is financial inclusion, education, and protection. These are the three things that are key to the inclusion of the, and protecting the consumers. Next, we have uh, Puan Marina Baharudin, CEO of Ombudsman for Financial Services. On the, to my right are the two speakers who talk about the consumers and their protection. And on my left are the two people uh, who will, one of them will talk about the technology and the digitalization. The other one is how to improve the rating and consumer awareness in, in business. So we have uh, a, a quite a good panel. Now I leave to Marina to. Thank you, Dato. All right, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All right, okay. Um, I wonder how many of you have heard of the Ombudsman for Financial Services? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Maybe I'll just give an, a very short introduction as to who we are. All right, now the Ombudsman for Financial Services, or OFS in short, we are an alternative dispute resolution body set up to resolve disputes uh, between the financial consumers and the financial service providers licensed and approved by the Bank Negara Malaysia. We are appointed the um, operator of the Financial Ombudsman Scheme by BNM, pursuant to the Financial Services Act and the Islamic Financial Service Act of 2016, uh, 13, from Oct uh, 1st October 2016. Now, we are guided by the six principles of independence, accessibility, transparency, fairness and impartiality, accountability, and effectiveness. So what do we do here? We resolve disputes up to a monetary uh, a, a value of 250,000 ringgit. So we have got uh, you know, our dispute resolution process, a two-tiered dispute resolution process uh, called the case management stage and as well as the adjudication stage. Now, when the cases come to the OFS, we would screen the complaints, and uh, those eligible disputes will be registered and handled by the case manager at the case management stage. So what happens at the case management stage? We try and resolve it um, amicably through mediation, conciliation, and facilitation. So if a case is not resolved at that stage, case management stage, it will be referred to the ombudsman for a final decision. And the ombudsman's final decision is binding on the parties if the consumer accepts the decision. Right, now I'll just share with you the type of complaints or the type of disputes that we received. The top three disputes are um, life insurance claims and followed by motor own damage claims, general insurance, internet banking as well as uh, unauthorized transactions relating to credit card. Now I'd like to zoom into the you know typical type of complaints that we received uh, currently. 
that is, uh, the unauthorized transactions uh, due to the lost and stolen cards or you know, the digital uh, internet banking, where we find that the consumers you know, being vulnerable, you know, they have um, um, exposed their banking credentials to the fraudsters unknowingly. So what do they do when they come to us? We will look at it um, independently. And um, uh, what we look at is how fast these consumers informed their financial institutions of the um, unauthorized transactions and how fast the financial institutions um, contacts the counterpart, a counterpart bank to recover this money. You know, uh, currently there are, we receive quite a number of complaints uh, relating to transfer of money from a credit card into an e-wallet account. And these e-wallet accounts are being used as meals or a conduit you know, for, to enable them to transfer money locally or, you know, abroad. So certain protection need to be made by the uh, EMAN, e -man, I mean the institutions. Number one is, of course, uh, consumer education, right? Uh, whether there's sufficient education uh, given to the consumer or any awareness of such scams, was it, you know, is, is it sufficient or not? Because I see, you know, warnings being placed, you know, uh, I mean, in the media, by the institutions, but yet consumers fall prey to these scams. So uh, in conclusion, we observe that, you know, consumers are also the weakest link here, right? Whether we have done enough. Number two is the security the security of this, um, you know, internet system or even e-wallet, e-money, the credentials such as the one-time passwords, right? Uh, whether the, the e-money companies uh, issuers are, you know, robust enough in their, um, you know, uh, system, right, to, to protect them. So basically, um, these are, you know, our observations. So uh, when it comes to the OFS, we will look at these criteria, and uh, we don't take sides, of course. You know, yes, a person would have lost money or being scammed. You know, there's no way for them to recover the money. But we will also look into whether there's any operational shortcomings from the banks or the institution, and whether the banks can work together to um, to recover the money. Yeah. So overall, um, I'll just share some statistics. In 2019, uh, we received about 4,385 complaints, which is a slight reduction compared to 2018. About 1,047 complaints are being registered as eligible disputes out of which 69% are insurance uh, disputes, 30% are banking, and 1% relate to uh, payment systems. Out of the um, 1,047 cases registered, including those uh, you know, carried forward from the previous year, um, about 944 cases were resolved leaving a 436 cases outstanding. And most of these cases are resolved, about 42% of these cases are settled amicably at the case management stage. So the ombudsman in their decision, what they do is um, they have regard to the terms of contract, applicable law, uh, regulations, standards and guidance by Bank Negara and also the good banking practice and what we feel is fair and reasonable in all circumstances. So, um, basically, yeah, in terms of consumer protection, you know, all of us play a very important part, yeah. 
the institutions as well as the regulators, as well as OFS. We are also, uh, what we are trying to do is to you know, spread more awareness as to what the consumer can do when they're scammed, for example. Or if they have lost their, uh, you know, uh, their car, motor vehicle accident, what can they do? What, what steps can they take? You know, to report the accident, yeah. Okay, so um, basically, yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Marina. Uh, I was telling her earlier that uh, probably she needs to a little bit advertise about her services, like PIDM. Huh? PIDM has been very aggressively educating the public about this, this, the insurance, that they, they, they are all protected. So OFS probably needs to do a little bit more, and then you will find more complaints coming to you. <laughs> and it was quite uh, striking that even though we are only 40% penetration in insurance, 60% of the complaints coming from the insurance industry. So there is uh, something that we need to be mindful of. Uh, and, uh, and security is very, very important because unless people feel secure, then they will not uh, go to banks or financial institutions or e-wallets or internet banking or digital banking. So thank you for outlining the, your uh, OFS and its services. Now we have uh, Samsudin from EY who will talk about the development of the technological side eh, in the, and how we could include uh, or improve the financial literacy and financial inclusion to those who have not enjoyed banking here. Okay, uh, thank you Dato. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we are in, in the middle with, in between our sessions and also uh, leaving from this uh, hotel. Uh, I'll try to uh, articulate five key elements into my presentations today, yeah, my talk today. The first one is on the consumer protections under, from the consumer perspective in terms of the uh, protecting the unbanked, right? Uh, or maybe in some uh, situation we call it as underbank or underserved customer. The second element is on the financial inclusion. Uh, the third element will be in terms of how the technology disruptions into the financial institutions uh, uh, business activities. The fourth one will be on the needs for financial literacy. And the fifth one is on the consumer protection itself. So when we look at this, um, when we look at from the customer perspective, why there is an existence of the unbanked or underserved customer? Um, I am looking this at but from the perspective of the customer itself, where the first thing that I can come up with is on the accessibility. When we talk about accessibility, we talk about accessing the banking or financial services uh, at any time and anywhere. So we know that the traditional banking, we have a normal banking hours. Uh, we know that uh, in the traditional banking, we have a local banking, a normal banking hall where you need to conduct a banking transactions at the banking hall. But when we move into the new era, we are looking at the digitalizations. We are looking at digital banking where the accessibility to the financial system is 24 seven. And you can do it anywhere as long as you have internet access. We know that now um, the coverage of internet access in Malaysia is widely uh, accessible. So everybody, uh, with uh, maybe at the uh, some remote areas, they may have access to the internet where they can have access to internet banking so that indirectly they have access to the banking system. When we look back from pre before the existence of digital, digital banking, we may want to look at the introductions of agent banking. 
but to what extent the bank or the financial institutions is introducing the agent banking services to the remote uh, customers in uh, consumers in the remote area so i believe that with the transitions to digital banking the accessibility is much wider although it may not be uh, for the whole spectrum of age customers uh, but I, I, it, it, it indeed increased in terms of accessibility. The second point is affordability that we want to look at because in some of the, uh, the situation, uh, the, the, the pricings of the services much may be more expensive. For I give you for example, if you want to do a, 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 a international remittance, yeah, using banking system, it will be much more expensive than remittance through the remittance service provider. So this will be some of the, 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 the area that we may want to consider in terms of affordability that restrict people from going to the bank to have the services. Um, okay, And then the third one is on the improved security. When we talk about info security, we talk about digitalization, digital banking, internet banking, uh, phone banking uh, earlier than that. How secure that we want to say that, oh, I am doing it, uh, I don't have any confidence because it is my phone, my phone can be hacked, uh, I can be tapped in order for my, my information and banking service, banking, banking uh, accounts being hijacked. Okay? But, we may want to look at later stage in terms of the protection. So, for example, can Bank Negara come up with the requirement of risk management in IT, for example, RMIT. So this will come as a countermeasure of protections in order to protect the systems from the vulnerability uh, of the uh, identity theft or account theft uh, and, and sort of. Okay. And then the, fifth, the fourth one that I want to highlight in terms of why they can be unbanked and also underserved customer is because of adverse banking history. I, I think, uh, I believe Mr. Eric will talk about uh, CITOS later on on the adverse credit history. And on the other spectrum of it, we may want to talk about the adverse uh, media or adverse, new, uh, adverse uh, news uh, or information about the customer. Say, for example, customer may be involved in previously involved in criminal, maybe customer being, uh, being, being identified as a mule or victims of mule. This also will, uh, will, will, will uh, forbid them or will put them away from the uh, banking industry. So now we want to look into the how we want to include them back into the ecosystem because the further they go from the ecosystem, the protections to them are become lesser because when we look at this, if you don't have any access to financing, you may want to go into along or in the modern technology, you may want to go for financing through crowd crowdfunding. So to what extent you are being protected? Because we know that banking industry or financial institutions are highly regulated and it is must be run and then uh, to be to do operated in accordance to the guidelines issued by Bank Negara. So the pro customer protections is there, information protections of the customer is there and then in terms of uh, uh, victimize I think in terms of uh, 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 in terms of how it, we know the finance ombudsman which is one of the area on the protections of the customer then this is a financial inclusions because in to, with a bit uh, bank negara issue a financial inclusion in financial services uh, sector blueprint 2011 to 2020 which among others, Bank Negara aim that uh, the adoptions of innovative channels uh, to have a wider coverage and then expand a uh, range of product and services and then uh, strengthen institutional arrangement, uh, meaning that uh, in terms of channels, uh, products and services and then also uh, enhance knowledge and capacity to understand the activities of financial services and products that are available in the industry. 
So this one is the initiative by Bank Negara where Bank Negara ultimately come out with uh, the uh, customer protections, RMIT, and then come out with the uh, digital banking exposure draft of bank digital banking, which five license will be issued, a uh, plan to be issued on the digital banking to have a wider coverage for unbanked and underserved bank. And then, because this one is to protect against the disruptions, so we uh, the, the the government or bank negara understand that ah uh, there is some disruptions into the financial system through fintech. That is why Bank Negara come out with the uh, sandbox, regulatory sandbox, to allow for the financial, uh, the fintech company to come to Bank Negara and then uh, innovate the products with the supervisions of Bank Negara. So by that, the cost consumers are being protected. Okay? Then uh, we are also looking at the, the countermeasures, as I mentioned earlier, one of it is the digital banking. The aim of the digital banking based on the exposure draft is to support or to, 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 in, to, um, to convince the unbanked and underserved customer to be part of the customer uh, to, uh, under the financial, financial inclusion. Okay? Because the expectation is the for the the pricing is lower and also accessibility is wider and then we look at financial literacy i have two questions on the financial literacy before i, I conclude one we always talk about financial uh, 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 literacy on understand the product understand the risk understand the protection and under, understand the customer rights but have we ever considered in terms of what customers should know about the do's and don'ts. Okay, so this is where a lot of frauds and also mule accounts. I think uh, you might be aware that PDRM is very hard on the mule accounts when they have a same up mule websites and all those things. So um, we need to, to make sure that the, the account holder, the, the consumer know that they are responsible to, the, to their accounts, regardless of who is managing the account. So this is something that we, meet, we need to put an, more emphasis on this. Only recently we noticed on this area. Uh, then I think, um, I think that is something that I can uh, explain to the, now. Uh, so I leave it back to Dato. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So to, just to briefly summarize, uh, underserved is because of accessibility, affordability, and then literacy. I think these are the three things that uh, we can take away from Samsudin's uh, presentation. Uh, finally, we come to Mr. Eric Chin, who is the CEO of CTOS. He will talk about how we can educate the, the consumers about rating and financial information available to the consumers and customers and uh, what they have been doing on uh, providing information to financial institutions. Thank you, Dato. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Tantri right? uh, and, and KSI for inviting CITOS uh, to this uh, distinguished uh, conference. right? Um, good evening, everyone, as well, my, pan my, my, my senior pa panelists. Uh, maybe just a very quickly, you know, just a show of hands, right? How many of you are bankers? Wow, okay. Only two bankers. So the rest are non-bankers, so you are consumers. Well, every one of us are actually consumers, essentially, right? So um, just maybe just do a very quick introduction about uh, CITOS. Um, CITOS, we are the leading credit reporting agency in Malaysia today. Uh, we are very proud of the fact that you know, today uh, we support most of the major banks in Malaysia. right? Uh, and I think one stats that we like to, I will always like to share you know, with our clients is that for every four credit reports right, that's issued out in Malaysia, three of them actually come from CITOS. Now what do we do? There are three key market segments that we serve today. right? The first segment is essentially the banks, uh, the financial institutions, the DFIs, right? So this is 
are one of our major uh, clients, right? Now, the second area that we serve is that we serve the SME as well, right? So we serve the engine of growth of Malaysia. So today we have over 20,000 SMEs who are actually our clients. Uh, they leverage on our services and our products to, do, to make better credit decisions. Now, the third area which is very, very important to us and which we have been uh, very focused on over the last five years is the consumer segment, right? So the consumer segments, and I, and I think consumer segments uh, is very key for us because today I think one of the uh, challenges is uh, what we see today is that a lot of consumers think that access to credit or financial inclusion is a right. Well, unfortunately, I have to tell you that it's not a right. right? And I think the bankers will, will, will agree with me. Right? Now, banks are custodian of the public funds. Right? Everybody puts their savings in the banks as deposits. Right? And, and these savings right, needs to be managed in, uh, in a manner whereby risk needs to be managed right, by the banks. Right? And, and that's where there are a lot of issues and concerns saying that, you know, is access to financing actually there? Now, let's talk a bit about the topic today, right? The topic today is about unbanked, right? How do we protect the unbanked segment of the Malaysian population, especially when digital banking comes in? Now, I think let's, before we actually go into more detail, right? I think maybe let's have an understanding of what's unbanked, right? It's, it's a very well used word, right? Some people say underbank, unbanked underserved, right? And maybe I will share with you some uh, statistics which you may find interesting as well. Now, there is this uh, organization called uh, Alliance of Financial Inclusion. So what they do is that they monitor countries' financial inclusion index, right? So in 2019, for Malaysia itself, there are two key index that I would like to share with you. First of all, do you know how many percent of the adult Malaysian population has at least one banking account? Now, banking account here means a deposit account. So the answer is 96%. So that is in 2019. So 96% of the adult Malaysian population has a banking account, right? Now, adult population, what is actually adult population? So, the latest stats is that there's 32 million uh, Malaysians today. Adult population is 18 years and above. And that number is about 22 million, right? So, close to tw over 20 million people have actually having uh, at least one deposit account. Anyone here that doesn't have any deposit account? No, right? So, we are 100% in this room. Now, the second interesting stats is this. How many percent do you think has a credit product account. Now, credit product account here means it could be a credit card, it could be a mortgage, it could be an auto loan, right? a personal loan, so and so forth. Now, that, that statistics was, was actually quite surprising to me. Uh, I, right? And the, the statistics is actually 40%. So only 40% of the 22 million adult population has a credit product account, right? And that means that there's 13 million Malaysians who don't have a credit card, doesn't have access to uh, what you call a housing loan to get a house, to get a car, so on and so forth, right? And this is the segment that the digital banking is supposed to uh, address, right? The unbank. Okay, so I think that's interesting. Now, the, some, some other interesting uh, insight is this, right? Today, if someone who, has, who is unbanked goes to a commercial bank and apply for a credit card, what are the chances of this person getting approved? I think it's almost zero, right? It's almost zero, right? Dato Noripa should know, <laughs> right? And the reason is very clear is because there is no and no track record, there is no credit information, there's no credit history. This person is invisible, right? Nobody knows anything about this person. So why would a bank lend money, right? I think that's quite straightforward. 
You just think about it, right? You're walking in KLCC shopping, someone tap you at the back and said, hey, bro, $50, please. Would you give $50? No, right? So why would a bank give extend out loan to someone who is invisible, right? And this is where the challenge is, right? So it means that today, based on a banking track record, and as CRAs, right, what we do is that we provide scoring. Essentially, what it means is that all of us, including the banks and CRAs, can only score 40% of the population, right? Where else another 60% of the population is unscorable, right? So I think first things first, when we talk about digital banking, yes, concept is good, right? The idea of having digital banking where people can, uh, at the comfort of their home, right? 24 by seven, right? You can actually apply for a credit product, right? Very interesting, very good. But the question is, can the digital bank make a credit decision without the necessary information? Right, so this, the, that, that, that is the crux of the matter. Um, and, and this is where I think, you know, uh, there is a need to look at and explore other means of uh, ways to assess and evaluate an unbanked uh, borrower, right, or prospective borrower. Uh, and this is something that is very close to the heart to Fositos. Uh, we are looking at uh, different ways, right, of how we can actually when someone is invisible, right, how can we make them visible? What are the other information that's available to score them? Okay, so that's, that's an initiative that we are running right now. And uh, I think one interesting data point that we can use is actually telco data, right? So again, sorry, a bit stats, a bit more statistics for you all. MCMC recently uh, 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 specified that if you talk about mobile phone, Right? Mobile phone penetration in Malaysia today is at 139%. Very interesting, right? How can you get 139%? Because if you look at people like uh, Sam, for example, right, very busy, he has three mobile phones. Right? So that's the reason. So the penetration in uh, mobile phone right, means that there is certain data that could be used for unbanked, for example. Right? An unbanked person would mo potentially have mobile phone. And the mobile phone data, for example, how they pay back their mobile phone uh, or how they top up their prepaid. This could be a data that is used uh, as part of the unbanked uh, borrower's uh, assessment. Yeah? So that's, that's something that perhaps you know, we will see further development uh, as we go along. Now, this, the other area, I think, in conjunction with digital banking today is that while people, while we are providing convenience, right, there is also a concern, especially among consumers, and I think we discussed that uh, quite extensively, is how do you actually verify the identity of the person, you know, who is actually applying for credit online, right? So for a digital bank, how do they know that this person is who he or she, who he say he is, right? I think that's one thing. Unlike a, what you call brick and mortar bank, right? You need to actually walk into a bank, do your biometrics, insert your my card, do a biometric, the officer will look at you, look at your card and say, ah, you are who you are, right? But digital banking is all about doing things, right, hidden somewhere. And, and this is where I think there are a lot of uh, technology and advancement. Uh, I believe this uh, morning there were some speakers who spoke about EKYC. Uh, so for CITOS, I think we are also, you know, one of the trailblazer in terms of providing EKYC solution. Uh, what we do is today is that we are leveraging on the power of technology, things like, for example, motion detection, facial recognition, OCR, plus in combination with data that we have to basically support the process of digital, digitally uh, identifying someone, right? So this is some of the things that we are doing. And, and with that as well, we hope that we can play a part in terms of protection of consumer rights by ensuring that their identity is safe when they transact online, right? And that nobody will use their identity to apply for services under a digital bank. Right. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, 
for this interesting statistics that only 40% have uh, credit in the country. Eh? That means there's a vast uh, segment there for either the digital banks to tap or even the conventional banks to tap with proper systems, you know, IT and, uh, in place. And uh, with that, uh, I'm mindful of the fact that you all have been here since morning. So I'm controlling my narcissism to ask any questions to the panelists again. Uh, unless you have uh, questions from the floor, please uh, ask the panelists. Uh, I'm not going to ask any questions so that uh, to manage time effectively. Please uh, introduce yourself and ask questions if there are any. Maybe we ask them questions. Yes. I suppose because all the the people here are all banked, you know, they are not unbanked people. So we are asking the wrong audience to ask questions. So probably it will have to be in, in an audience where the people are not banking and they may have a lot of questions to ask you all. So with that, I think uh, in view of, we have overshot the time by almost uh, uh, 35, 40 minutes. Huh? Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists and please show your sense of appreciation to the panelists. Huh? Thank you.